So, <clears throat> this is again the start of a new lecture and in this lecture we um, start a completely different topic now. Um, so, the past module I think about 5 lectures or so, we concentrated 5-6 lectures we concentrated on magnetic ceramics. So, in that uh, module we basically discussed the fundamentals of magnetism, uh, what is the origin of magnetic moment, what are the dif what are different kinds of magnetism, um, how do you differentiate between them and what is the origin for those uh, magnetism, magnetic uh, mechanisms. And then based on that we moved on to uh, magnetic ceramics which are essentially ferrites, uh, cubic ferrites, hexagonal ferrites and garnets and then we looked at some properties with this with reference to the applications. So, in this module now we will we'll focus on some of the exotic or a special kind of electroceramics which are not dealt in detail uh, any any kind of detail in in most of the textbook except a few and uh, uh, at undergraduate level or uh, senior undergraduate level or early graduate level there are virtually very few books which mention. So, in this module we will we'll have uh, we will dedicate about a lecture each to these materials, so that I introduce you to them and give you some references which you can go on uh, read uh, later on. So, so this is uh, module number 7 which is based on a special or exotic electroceramics. Uh, now, the first category in this that we will first category of materials that we will talk about in this module is uh, essentially high temperature. superconductivity superconducting ceramics now an introduction to high temperature superconducting ceramics does not uh, happen without an introduction to the superconductivity itself so what we'll do is that we'll initially introduce superconductivity talk about low temperature superconductors a bit some of the fundamental um, principles behind superconductivity and then we will move on into high temperature superconductivity a bit and then we will look at some of the applications which are useful. Now, uh, the reference book which I would uh, recommend you to read is Principles of Electronic Ceramics by L. L. Hench and J. K. West, and this is a Wiley publication. So you can read about superconductors in this book, and there are numerous papers in journals. and reviews which can help you understand this principle a little bit more and again there are several books other books which can take you through this journey to superconductivity. Now, superconductivity as a name itself suggests it is like superconducting materials which are highly conducting and what this essentially means is that that these materials have zero resistance um, in the superconducting state. Now, the superconductivity is essentially has been remain has remained a, a very hot topic for more than 50 years or so and uh, this is essentially because this ability to have zero resistance is something which is unique and this can allow us to develop variety of applications without losing any power because of resistance of the material. So, this is something which is essentially a, a, a very nice concept a very nice um, uh, philosophy scientific philosophy, but it is very hard it is not easy uh, materials which exhibit superconductivity are also very rare they are not uh, not every material in, in, uh, in on the earth exhibits superconductivity. Now, as far as high temperature superconductivity is concerned this became an intense topic of research after the discovery of superconductivity in materials like. So, high temperature superconductivity It was, in e, it was discovered in, in, in an oxide of barium, lanthanum, copper, oxygen uh, by Bednors and Muller 
uh, and this fueled in 1986 basically not too old phenomena and this discovery which happened to show a transition temperature of 40 kelvin which mean which meant that below 40 kelvin these materials were superconducting that is they had zero electrical resistance was a major boost to finding superconductivity in oxides and followed by this in 1987 the superconductivity has discovered in another oxide which is yttrium barium copper oxide and this showed a tc of about 90 k and this was a major boost to superconducting research because this temperature is very high this temperature is higher than liquid nitrogen temperature and that allows you to operate your devices at liquid nitrogen temperature which is a lot cheaper than liquid helium uh, if you were if you had a tc below 77 kelvin so uh, that, so commercially this made lot of sense to have this kind of material which have high tc so uh, so, this sort of set the tone for high temperature superconducting ceramics uh, research uh, as well as devel um, uh, development of applications. Now, what we will do is that we will first discuss the uh, uh, we will first discuss the general aspects of superconductivity. Uh, which will include uh, first generation superconductors followed by uh, some of the basic principles such as Meissner effect etcetera and then we will look at uh, some of the high TC materials. So, we will we'll start with discussion on low temperature superconductivity and this low temperature superconductivity discussion uh, will essentially to give you background information now superconductivity was discovered in 1911 by uh, a dutch scientist h h k onus who was basically studying the properties of liquid mercury at li uh, mercury at liquid helium temperatures and then he suddenly discovered that you know below liquid helium temperatures or around liquid helium temperatures this mercury was superconducting and that was something which was a surprise to him and what essentially it meant was that uh, the, re the resistance as a function of temperature suddenly dropped to zero at a particular temperature and and this was called as TC or transition temperature or critical temperature in the lingo of superconductivity. So, this is critical temperature. So, beyond this uh, beyond this temperature essentially the material remains uh, uh, superconducting and essentially the behavior is uh, it's not it's it's not like this, but rather it is it is sort of uh, if you if you take it above TC, it is sort of like this and then of course, uh, it follows some sort of power law uh, when you when you reach normal temperatures. So, essentially what it means is that there is a drop of temperature uh, below uh, there is a blood drop of resistance electrical resistance of the material uh, to 0 ohms below a particular temperature which is called as TC or a critical temperature and these first generation superconductors were essentially And these first generation superconductors were essentially metals or metallic alloys and they are typically they are called as essentially low temperature or low T c superconductors. And what do you mean by low T c superconductors is essentially the T c is lower than 30 Kelvin that was the definition of these low T c superconductors. And the materials which followed this were you know uh, metals and metallic alloys and even in this there was a distinction uh, pure elements like p 
pure elements such as you know um, um, your tin or aluminum etc or mercury uh, these all elemental uh, pure elemental metals these were called as type 1 uh, superconductors and while the alloys such as you know <coughs> niobium nitride alloy niobium titanium alloys niobium germanium alloys and variety of other alloys they were called as type 2 superconductors and what is type 1 and type 2 that will be clear to you in a while but <coughs> this was the definition of low temperature superconductivity in metallic systems uh, before the advent of uh, high temperature superconductivity now uh, essentially this onset of superconductivity when the superconductivity takes place so you of course have a difference you of course have a change in resistance so uh, if you if you plot uh, resistance versus temperature then of course you reach zero resistance so this is zero rho is equal to zero followed by you know some sort of power law and this power law could be anything depending upon the material or system typically it goes as rho is proportional to t to the power 3 or something like that. So, this temperature would be called as T c and this line would be actually more like a straight line. So, this is this is uh, let me just draw it correctly. So, this line would be more like a straight line before following some sort of power law and this is your temperature dependence of resistance but this is also accompanied by change in the physical properties for example one of these is super specific heat so if i now plot a specific heat this is specific heat now scales are arbitrary so except the except that um, resistance is zero below tc uh, the specific heat follows a linear relation uh, cv is proportional to t at temperatures above tc but below temperature tc it follows some sort of uh, behavior which is exponential of minus alpha by t. So, this alpha is some sort of a constant which depends upon material so, and this abrupt change in. So, you see that near the transition you have an abrupt change in the change in the specific heat and this abrupt change in the specific heat if you are aware of uh, discussion that we uh, that we uh, carried out during discussion on phase transition in ferroelectrics such abrupt changes in physical properties like specific heat are signature of some type of phase transition. So, essentially what you can say is that onset of superconductivity at T is equal to T c which is the critical temperature is associated with some type of phase transition ok. So, this is essentially physically what happens in superconductivity. Now, superconductivity as a phenomena as a phenomena it is a purely quantum mechanical phenomena. and uh, just like magnetism and, and you know modern and many other modern topics in physics this is purely a quantum mechanical phenomena it cannot be explained by classical mechanics and uh, for, for some time there was no theory to explain superconductivity there were futile attempts made you know just by talking of you know some sort of super fluid or some sort of cooperative movement of electrons or uh, 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 etc etc but all these attempts which were made to explain superconductivity they were they were they went in vain because they could not explain uh, it very well so what happened was in 1957 bcs theory which was coined after Bardeen, Cooper and Schiffer three scientists Bardeen was John Bardeen and Cooper was uh, 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 Leon Cooper and Robert Schiffer these three scientists together they discovered this theory in 1957 
based on what is called as a formation of Cooper pairs in the superconducting materials, which gives rise to this kind of superconducting behavior, and for for which these the Bardeen, Cooper, and Schieffer, all three got Nobel Prize of Physics. in 1972. So, this was a major discovery in, in, in explaining the theory of superconductivity which, which uh, and, and this was essentially based on flow of some sort of superfluid or, or you can say the current which flows in the superconducting state is nothing but due to flow of a superfluid consisting of what is called as Cooper pairs or pair of ele electrons which essentially interact through the wire lattice interaction and this was something which was very important to understand. And another thing which is uh, noticed for many superconductors is that many superconductors have low resistivity. Uh, although it is a uh, it is a condition which is uh, um, which is followed in many many, many cases it is not a necessary condition. So, you can say low resistivity is uh, followed, but not a mandatory condition. So, it is not a constraint as such, just like in ferroelectricity you have constraint like you know it has to be non center symmetric, it is not a constraint for a superconducting state. Now, we look at the we look at the formation of Cooper pairs in a while, uh, how the how the BCS theory came into picture. But some other features of uh, superconducting materials is they follow what is called as Meissner effect, and this Meissner effect is essentially an effect which distinguishes uh, uh, superconducting materials from the diamagnetic materials. Many times people confuse between these two effects, but they're not exact. They're not similar. They are very different. Meissner effect is essentially it describes the response of superconducting material to magnetic field in the superconducting and non superconducting states uh, or basically in the superconducting states. And this goes after two uh, German scientists Meissner and Oschenfeld. who discovered this in 1933. And what they discovered was that when you when, when a superconductor is placed in a magnetic field beyond a certain field which is called as a critical field H c superconductivity does not exist it vanishes. So, even if you are below T c material when it is in superconducting state it does not remain superconducting if you keep on applying the magnetic field beyond a certain extent. Now, when you when it is when the field is below T c then field does not penetrate the material, it penetrates only partially on the surface of the material otherwise it is completely repelled and this depth of penetration is very small it is called as it is about few few hundred nano uh, 100 nanometer or maybe smaller than that and it is called as London penetration depth. So, what essentially it is? So, when you have T greater than T c, so if you take a superconducting piece of material it is a normal metal. So, normal metal when you apply field to it so, this is normal. So, normal metal means field penetrates. Completely. So, is we can write this is normal state. And so, this is your material and this is your field H. Now, when T is less than T c which means you are in superconducting state, then when you have this material and when you apply field this field is like this it, it bends around the sample like this. So, you have massive flux lines on the surface, but nothing penetrating inside. So, the whole of the field that you apply gets repelled and this 
repulsion gift is essentially explained in terms of what is called as a opposite magnetization. So, which means material is doing something which is repelling the whole field. This is like conceptually similar to diamagnetism, but it is not diamagnetism because this this is a dependent this is a function of temperature. And so, when you are above T c it is completely repelled when you are below T uh, sorry when you are below T c it is completely repelled when you are above T c it is completely penetrated. So, it is not diamagnetic effect on the other hand diamagnetic effect is essentially based on Lenz's law when you apply field you essentially create a current which is which gives rise to a magnetization which is opposing the applied field and this is not which is happening here. So, it is not a diamagnetic effect rather it is called as a Meissner effect. The outcome is sort of similar because you get a magnetization opposing the uh, applied field, but, uh, uh, but the causes are different. So, this is your field is repelled completely and this thick skin around the material uh, in which the penetration takes place little bit thin layer. So, there is some interaction which is taking place out on the outer surface this is this is called as your London penetration depth lambda and it is of the order of 100 nanometer or maybe smaller. So, uh, so it is only up to this depth this effect is important. So, that is why this kind of effect is very important in thin films, because thin films when the dimensions of thin films are very small they are less than 100 nanometer then there are some strange things which happen with uh, uh, which may happen uh, there. So, in, in whereas in bulk materials it is a it is a fairly uh, straightforward thing. So, essentially uh, the difference with diamagnetic material is diamagnetic materials follow Lenz's law, which means they have a current which gives rise to magnetization which opposes H, whereas uh, superconducting materials have nothing to do with So, essentially the effects are similar, but causes are different uh, both have negative susceptibility. So, superconductors you can say have chi is equal to minus 1 below T c, but it is it is positive when T is greater than T c. So, this is the essential difference whereas, for diamagnets The sky is not a function of temperature and it is always negative and also uh, there is a dependence on Lenz's law for a diamagnetic material. So, this is a major difference between these two. So, essentially, but what you can see th that since in the superconducting state when you apply a magnetic field it completely repels the magnetic field which means you can you can you can you can give rise to essentially very large surface magnetization which is opposing the uh, magnetic field and this can be used for a lot of good applications which we will see later and 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 this this is very useful for uh, variety of applications uh, so essentially diamagnetic effect is because of uh, just just to summarize diamagnetic effect is because of uh, uh, orbiting electrons which give rise to current which is which, uh, which in turn gives rise to a magnetization opposing the magnetic field in, the, in superconducting state it is not true it is something else. Okay. Uh, so, another concept which comes uh, in the wake of this uh, Meissner effect is called as critical field and this critical field is essentially H c and so when you can say H c. So, when when H is greater than H C at then in the you can say in the superconducting state the material does not remain superconducting. So, how essentially you see it as so when you apply 
let us say this is magnetic field, this is temperature. Okay. So, there is a correlation here. So, this is H C and this is T C. So, of course, at 0 field uh, below T C the material becomes superconducting. So, this region is superconducting regime. Uh, anything above it becomes a normal. So, what you see is that the T C of a material decreases as you increase the magnetic field. So, this is a correlation of T C and H C and this H C is given as H naught multiplied by 1 minus T divided by T C square. So, this is the relation which relates H C and T C in the parabolic form and so this is true for what we called as type 1 superconductor this kind of behavior. In case of type 2 superconductor there is a slight difference. Now, what essentially it is in case of type 2 I will use different colors in case or I will use different plot let us say. So, in case of type 2 the so again magnetic field temperature. Now, in case of type 2 you have similar effect here in the lower field side. So, you have T c and then H, but what you have here is H c 1 and below H c 1 you have super conducting state, but beyond H c 1 the region is essentially. So, this is normal state and beyond these two you have normal plus superconducting and this boundary between. So, essentially this boundary between H c 1 and H c 2 below T c is a region where normal and superconducting states coexist and this is what is found in type 2 superconductors and this is where the difference type 1 and type 2 came. Type 1 was mostly elemental metals and type 2 were mostly alloys and this is essentially a very important. Uh, so, it basically what this, Meissner, this critical field and Meissner effect do is that they essentially define a boundary uh, at, uh, between uh, between the uh, when you when you draw a plot of magnetic field and temperature they define a boundary between the normal and superconducting state and determine the field uh, uh, above which the material does not uh, remain uh, superconducting. So, uh, this is a very uh, important concept again and and the critical fields for instance for type 1 superconductor. So, H c for type 1 could be of the order of less than a tesla or so and for type 2 it could be since they have this region where normal and superconducting uh, re, uh, phases can exist the fields can be as high as 40 to 50 tesla. So, uh, this is the advantage with uh, uh, type 2 superconductors that you can hold the superconductivity at least some superconductivity up to very high fields and this is very important for uh, um, application from the application point of view. Uh, now, now we come to what is called as theory of superconductivity. Now, theory of superconductivity as we said was proposed by BCS. Barin, Cooper and Schiffer and this was essentially put forward in 1957 at University of Illinois when these guys were working to explain the reasons and this was essentially uh, based on the formation of what is called as a Cooper pair and this formation of Cooper pair formation of Cooper pair and concept of Cooper pair was floated by uh, Leon Cooper who is one of this uh, uh, one of the scientists who put forward this theory. So, this Cooper pair is nothing but a pair of electrons which moves together in the lattice and this happens by interaction with the lattice. So, how it how you, how you have here is you have these lattice ions and what you have here is you have this pair of electrons. So, you have this pair of electrons which interacts with the lattice leads to some distortion in the lattice you can see that these two ions are closer to each other. So, there is a essentially uh, there is an interaction of electrons and lattice which gives rise to formation of this pair of electrons. So, this is your Cooper pair 
and this Cooper pair is supposed to be formed because of Coulombic attraction between electrons. You might wonder what is this Coulombic attraction between electrons. So, what essentially it is since you have a negative charge on, on the on the lattice on the on the electron uh, uh, essentially this uh, this negative charge on the electron in the lattice leads, leads to build up of positive charges around it and which in turn attracts another electron and this sort of leads to formation of what is called as a Cooper pair. It is a very simplistic uh, explanation that I am giving to you, but this is what it is in summary and this Cooper pair is essentially stable only when the binding energy of this Cooper pair is smaller than the thermal energy and this is why this superconductivity is a low temperature phenomena. So, this uh, since the binding energies are very small as a result it does not it is not seen at high temperatures. So, so essentially um, um, uh, this Cooper pair moves through the lattice by distorting the lattice and this sort of a demonstration of electron lattice interaction which was also verified experimentally where, where experiments were performed uh, by taking different atomic masses and T c was noted down and what the essential the idea was if, if the if the if, if I change the atomic mass then if there is a lattice interaction that T c would change and this is what was observed. So, uh, essentially uh, the beauty of this whole phenomena is you know the, the uh, coupling of this electrical phenomena with respect to mechanical process such as distortion of the lattice. So, uh, so this is what is essentially the theory of uh, superconductivity and the experimental validation which was done was essentially you have uh, temperature versus T c versus root of 1 divided by root of a and this was done for mercury for instance and mercury followed a sort of straight line. So, this is for instance somewhere here you have mercury 203.4, here you have mercury uh, H g 202 and here you have H g 200.7 and then 200.6 and uh, so on and so forth uh, until you go to very high like H g 198 and the transition temperature varies from. So, this is your 4.12 Kelvin and this goes to right up to like 4.18 Kelvin or so. So, the transition temperature was uh, varying when you change the atomic mass of mercury and uh, if you want to know about this you can go to this reference in physical review volume 78 page 477 1950 and then another one physical review again and then volume 78 page 487 and again in 1950. So, you can look at these two papers for experimental validation of the transition temperature in, in experimental validation of essentially interaction between the, the electrons and the lattice supporting the idea of formation of Cooper pair through the lattice distortion. Okay. So, now what we will do is that uh, we have discussed uh, this uh, um, theory of uh, superconductivity with a focus on fundamental principles like Meissner effect and, um, and uh, critical field. What we will do now is we will look at the high temperature superconductivity. And high temperature superconductivity, as I said in the beginning of the lecture, it was discovered in 1986 by Bednor's George, George Bednor's and Karl Muller at IBM Zurich uh, in 1986 when they discovered the superconductivity in this perovskite oxide, which was essentially lanthanum based. It, it was a cuprate layered oxide, so essentially lanthanum, uh, uh, lanthanum based cuprate and they discovered this as around uh, 35 Kelvin or 40 Kelvin, 35, 40 Kelvin and for which uh, Bednors and Muller they won Nobel Prize for Physics in 1987 
uh, in physics and so this was just after a year of the discovery one of the quickest Nobel prize ever given and this sort of created a lot of vibrations a lot of uh, flurry of research activities in superconductivity especially high temperature superconductivity because so far before this the superconductivity was limited to elemental metals and alloys this was the first time when the superconductivity was observed in something not metallic something which was oxide and previously oxides were studied as a dielectrics and as a ferroelectrics etc and structures were fairly well studied but this was the first time when something different was seen and that too starting with a high temperature like 35 Kelvin. It is reasonably high as compared much it was much higher as compared to at that time low temperature superconductivity. Now, this was followed by discovery of another compound uh, in 1987 which was yttrium barium copper oxide and this was uh, found in University of Alabama uh, where uh, um, uh, Paul I think Paul Wu and his, his, his researchers they, 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 they made this discovery and this has a TC of 92 Kelvin and this was a very, this was a landmark discovery because this gave rise to a hope that you know much more higher temperature transition temperature materials can be discovered simply because this 92 Kelvin as I said previously is higher than liquid, uh, liquid nitrogen temperature and that makes operation of superconductors much more easier and uh, and much more l much less troublesome and Paul Wu and his co-workers also found so we can write the name they also found that this conductivity superconductivity in yttrium barium copper oxide is highly sensitive to the composition so what they found was so this is essentially the formula is y b a 2 C u 3 O 7 minus x and this x was a very important and what they found was uh, the superconducting state occurs when x is about 0 0.15 and this is what shows the highest T c. However, when you make x greater than or equal to 0 0.6 superconductivity disappears. Okay. So, this is uh, the sort of composition beyond which uh, superconductivity does not remain. Now, followed by these discoveries uh, flurry of activities that took place on understanding the physics of uh, um, uh, physics of these materials, how the superconductivity takes place etcetera. Uh, there have been many attempts which have been made to understand the uh, physics of these materials. Um, however, unfortunately there is no consensus on the physics of operation of these materials, how the superconductivity occurs in these materials. Uh, they are typically type 2 superconductors, uh, but uh, the physics of these materials is not known. So, you can say that typically high T c oxides essentially most of these are oxides are type 2 superconductors, but the theory of the, the physics of operation or just like you have a BCS theory uh, put forward to explain low temperature superconductivity, the superconductivity in these materials is not very well understood. There have been some theories which have been proposed essentially again quantum mechanical theories, but uh, they have not been successful in explaining it completely. So, I will leave that out at the moment, but following this discovery of uh, 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 lanthanum based cuprate material and then yttrium barium copper oxide variety of other materials were studied. So, for instance, essentially uh, the major focus was on thallium based and mercury based compounds which showed much higher T c s. So, I will I'll show you some of the structures. So, so compound it is T c and structure and what you will see is that most of these oxides which were discovered they had this very simple perovskite based layered structure. So, that made life of crystallographers much more easier to understand them. So, you can have, so the first thing you can have is yttrium based. So, yttrium based was of course, Y B A 2 C U 3 O 7 
Now, I am not giving the non stoichiometry here. So, most of these oxides show superconductivity in some sort of non stoichiometry and this T c highest achieved was 92 Kelvin and this has an orthorhombic structure. Orthorhombic structure and then you have another, another category of bismuth based materials and these bismuth based materials variety of materials B i 2 S r 2 C u O 6 which had a T c of 20 Kelvin and this was tetragonal in nature. Now, you can build upon this now this is B i 2 B i 2 S r 2 C u O 6 if you tune the composition little bit then it is it gets much more bigger unit cell, but at the same time the T c increases. So, for instance, if you make B i 2 S r 2 C a C u 2 O 8. So, you can see that you have increased the layer of calcium oxide and when you put calcium oxide in, in, the, in the unit cell and increase the number of copper atoms as well, then the T c becomes 85 Kelvin and this is called as BISCO. And this again has a tetragonal structure much more bigger unit cell. Another one you can make some more alterations B i 2 S r 2 C a 2 C u 3 O again you can. So, you can say that you have increased C u O and C a O 2. So, you have increased another oxygen and another corpus O 10 and this gives rise to 110 Kelvin and this is again tetragonal. So, if you change the BISCO composition you can have the T c as high as 110 Kelvin. So, this is uh, you know a very nice discovery. Uh, the problem with these materials is that they are not easy to fabricate and that is what uh, that is why Y B C O remained still a very popular compound. And another category is thallium based compounds and in thallium based start you start with T L 2 B A 2 C u O 6 the parent compound and this parent compound shows a T c of 84 Kelvin and this is again tetragonal structured. You can add some more atoms to it again you do the same thing that you did in BISCO. So, you, you this becomes T L 2 B A 2 C A C u 2 O 8 and this has a T c of 108 Kelvin and then you have T L 2 2 B A 2 C A 2 C U 3 O 10 and this increases the T C further to 125 Kelvin again with the tetragonal structure and finally, when you make T L 2 B A 2 C U C A 3 C U 4 O 12 then this increases the T C to this decreases the T C now any further addition does not increase the T C and this remains at 122 uh, Kelvin or so roughly similar. Another category that you have is uh, is of mercury based again there you have H g B a 2 C u O 4 again you, you, you can see that all of these are cuprates they have copper layers in between. So, there is something to do with the copper layers which is important uh, barium copper oxide in these layers barium oxide copper oxide layers in these layers which make them superconducting. So, there is something to do with that which is which, which has to be understood B a 2 C a C u 2 O 6 and then you have H g B a 2 C a 2 C u 3 O 8 and these have T c's of 94, 128 and 134 Kelvin again all with tetragonal structure. So, you can see that these cuprates which have layers of copper oxides they have if you tune the composition by putting in variety of atoms in the structure you can change the T c quite well. The problem with truck, uh, mercury and thallium based is that mercury and thallium are difficult to handle uh, they are poisonous and they are not something and many countries have, have banned their use or restricted the use. So, as a result they did not pick up too much, but it is still massive a huge research was done on yttrium based uh, cuprate oxides. I uh, will show you the structure of yttrium based cuprate oxide which we went through in module 1 just to uh, recap what is the uh, structure like. So, 
if you if we go through this now uh, yttrium barium copper oxide. So, essentially the parent compound is Y C U 3 O 9 and here copper is in plus 3 state and this contains perovskite units where I the perovskite units would be some B O 6 A B O 3 kind of units and these A B O 3 kind of units are sandwiched in the layer form. Now, what you do in this material is you dope this material uh, by replacing yttrium with barium. So, this yttrium is replaced by barium. So, this modifies the structure. So, essentially what you have is uh, as, a, as a result now the difference here is yttrium is plus 3, barium is plus 2 and this leads to a reduction in the in order to maintain the stoichiometry this, uh, this leads to reduction of Cu plus 3 to plus 2 and which results in the reduction in the number of required oxygen atoms and hence what it does is it created it creates a vacancy of oxygen in the structure. So, you understand that you bring in one barium you of course, reduce the requirement of oxygen. Now, in order to compensate completely copper also reduces itself as a result because uh, uh, you have one charge deficiency here and another charge deficiency is caused by this reduction Cu 2 3 plus 2 plus to remove one oxygen and this causes this causes um, so, uh, so the moment you do that Y 3 Cu 3 O 9 it becomes Y Ba 2 Cu 3 O 8 and and what you have here is uh, followed by Y Ba 2 Cu 2 plus 2 plus Cu 3 plus only one now O 7 minus x. So, the structure changes like this. So, you have this Y 3 Cu 3 O 9 followed by Y Ba 2 Cu 3 O 8 and then C u 3 plus 2 2 plus for formation of by y b a 2 C u 2 2 plus C u 3 O 7. So, structure remains similar orthorhombic structure, but what you have here is as a result of the substitutions and uh, reduction uh, in the oxidation state, what you have here is vacancies of oxygen and these crosses are nothing but vacancies of oxygen and this also leads to changes in the coordination of uh, copper atoms. So, what you have here is essentially 5 fold coordination of copper 3 plus atoms along these rows and then uh, within these and, and, and within the plane you have this uh, 4 fold coordination of copper 2 plus atoms. So, this gives rise to anisotropic behavior in terms of conductivity of these materials and uh, so this is this is one primer on the structure of these materials similar structure or similar kind of tuning can be done in other superconducting oxides to give rise to uh, a variety of structures that we have uh, seen so essentially uh, just like you have formed yBO2 C yBA2 Cu3O7 you can start from Bi2 Sr2CuO6 and then you can keep on building uh, using these copper layers, copper oxide layers, uh, by 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 replacing copper with by by putting in calcium, increasing the number of copper, uh, change the TC, and this can happen with bismuth, thallium, and mercury based. All these three types of compounds. So this uh, sort of gives you an uh, a, a sort of understanding of what happens in these um, superconducting oxides. Now the superconducting oxides, since the Since the TCs are typically higher than uh, 77 uh, Kelvin, which is liquid nitrogen temperature, they have been thought of. Uh, they have been thought of. They are used in variety of applications, and uh, these applications could be, um, uh, you know, like magnetically levitated trains. You can have MRI imaging, you can have superconducting tapes, so a variety of applications have been proposed and some of them are already under use and this is essentially because of this fantastic nature of this material that it has a TC uh, below which it remains it, it offers 0 resistance and also below TC it offers complete repulsion of magnetic field as long as the magnetic field is below TC below HC. 
So, this is what is a f uh, very good quality uh, of uh, uh, this thing. Uh, material can be used in variety of forms. It has been studied in uh, thin film form, thin film forms can be made by variety of techniques, you can use physical vapor deposition methods. So, uh, essentially what you do here is you take a oxide target uh, which you either sputter or laser ablate um, on, on the substrates which are lying under and uh, as a result you can make thin films of IBCO for thin film applications and uh, if you want to make uh, bulk forms then in the bulk form just by mixing the so if you want to make YBCO YBA2CO3O7 for this you take yttrium oxide barium oxide or barium carbonate and then copper oxide CO2O or CuO mix them together in stoichiometric quantities and when you mix them together they form uh, they react with each other at high temperatures to form the desired desired phase under control atmosphere and temperature so under control conditions you do that similarly thin film form are made by physical vapor deposition process uh, you can make thick films as well and these thick films are used in superconducting tapes so for instance uh, one of the uses of these ybco is is in uh, conducting tapes and these conducting tapes of course, you cannot make a tape of a standalone ceramic because ceramic is brittle in nature. So, as a result you have to put it on a substrate and this substrate has to be uh, ductile so that it can take this it can take the it can it can sustain the, uh, the weight and it can keep the ceramic uh, crack free and these thick films are typically deposit on deposited on nickel tapes and these nickel tapes they have some adhesion layers in between and the thick films are formed by processes such as liquid phase epitaxy. So, essentially you melt the YBCO material and you draw the tape, tape through the through the um, uh, melt and YBCO deposits on, uh, um, on the nickel tape and, and it solidifies and forms a thick coating on top of nickel tape. Um, so, uh, so, this is another form in which YBCO can be used. Um, I will show you a couple of pictures of applications of these uh, materials. So, for instance, uh, one of the applications of superconducting ceramics is this magnetically levitated trains as they are called as maglevs. Now, these maglevs is essentially, uh, so you have this train which is running on the race track. Now, this race track of course, has uh, the essentially th there is no friction because of this repulsion so, you have this race track which, which can have superconducting material and this of course, has to operate at low temperature and then and, and you can have this train which can have magnets at its bottom and you know that since the field is repulsed by a superconductor. So, the race track can be you can you can have either of these two things either the track can be magnetic and that and the and the train can be superconducting um, uh, now, uh, but whatever it is because you have a repulsion of magnetic field these trains float in this magnetic field without any friction and they can run at very high speeds um, uh, 3 400 kilometers e per hour easily and there have been trials which have been done in countries like Japan and uh, they have been they are running in China and, uh, and Germany as well. Um, it is not a very common uh, phenomena it is not it is not a very common mode of operation or travel but it is something which has been used in some countries and there are trials which are being made in some other countries as well. Another useful application is, uh, is uh, your MRI imaging and this you must be more familiar. Uh, MRI is essentially magnetic resonance imaging and this is again with the essentially uh, in this in if you look at this image what you can see is various body parts and tissues etcetera and here you can find out the essentially the damage which has been done in the body through this imaging. So, what you have here is essentially uh, the, the superconductor uh, when you when you cool a superconductor below T c it repulses this magnetic field. So, this magnetic field which is repulsed is applied to the body 
and this essentially uh, uh, what happens is then then the molecules which are molecules fat molecules and the hydrogen atoms which are in the which are in the water uh, bond things in the body they are they for, they are forced to pick up the energy from the from the magnetic field and this sort of uh, and these species they release their energy at a certain frequency which can be detected and and and, and displayed in the form of an image by a computer so what you see here is you can see variety of ligaments and bones etc so any kind of damage that happen in any tissues and bones in the body can be very precisely imaged uh, in this uh, technique this is very essential technique for these applications health applications so essentially uh, you have these two applications applications which are of course in use uh, superconducting tapes are coming in picture um, and there are some laboratories in america which are uh, trying to commercialize these some companies as well uh, so essentially and so you ha you can have uh, thick tapes and another application is essentially is superconducting wires and these are essentially composites so what you have is a metal uh, sheet in which you flow a superconducting wire so you have metal uh, superconductor you have a metal and between them of course you have liquid nitrogen flowing and this uh, this can give rise to composite wire you have to put a metal because superconductor is oxide and brittle material so as a result it cannot sustain its weight when you have long cables and the uh, carrying the electricity so uh, but what this will do is that this will minimize the electrical losses and make the electricity uh, transmission much more efficient um, and save money in terms of power consumption so this is what is basically a primer on uh, superconducting materials with a uh, with some emphasis on superconducting ceramics i have given you the references you can go through these books and journals and reviews if you are interested you can go and read them plenty of literature is available on superconducting materials uh, so i i think you shouldn't have any problem uh, in in getting uh, more up to date knowledge on in this area um in the next module what we'll do is that uh, we'll take up another exotic class of materials which is multifluoric and magnetoelectric materials which are again being researched uh, in recent days in recent years because of their uh, some uh, fantastic properties and that will take up in the next module so just to summarize what we learned in this module we learned in this module we started with low temperature superconductivity uh, 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 which are nothing but essentially metals and metallic alloys type 1 and type 2 superconductors and uh, uh, then we followed with the the effect meissner effect which essentially uh, tells you about the dependence of uh, magnetic field and critical temperature and what it tells you is that uh, below tc when you apply a magnetic field above a certain level then the uh, super superconductivity ceases to exist and then you have uh, and the theory of superconductivity which is by bardeen cooper and schiffer and which uh, which is based on the principle of formation of cooper pair through the interaction with the lattice and then we looked at high temperature superconductors essentially oxides uh, which were discovered in 1986 not too long ago uh, uh, but there are some promising compounds like yttrium barium copper oxide and the the fantastic feature of these materials is that they are layered materials so you can keep building layers and layers by chemically modifying them and change the tc and which has been observed in variety of materials and however despite all the advances yttrium barium copper oxide still remains a favorite choice simply because it can be made easier uh, easily and, uh, and 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 it doesn't contain any toxic elements which otherwise are present in other materials and it has a tc which is higher than liquid nitrogen temperature so we'll stop here uh, and then in the next module we'll look at multifluoric and magnetic materials thank you